And when you heard the word record, we're not saying any, we don't know your names, we're not recording you, we're simply recording the information so that we're talking about. So Correct. let's go, what you got? Yeah. Well, the first question is, hi, Dr. Robin, Tammy. I have an iPhone and of course restrictions are on it. I have a trusted friend with my passcode. I have talked to several reps from Apple to reassure me there is no way around restrictions. Mentally, the fear is still there though. How do I handle triggers that are from fear? I'm basically creating a trigger when there is not one. Well, I think that's a textbook uh, definition for anxiety. <laughs> You know, like I'm worrying about things that haven't happened yet. I'm worried. And you're right. We can worry ourselves right into a slip. But I don't know about you, but the thing, well, there's a couple of things. I know this sounds stupid, but I'm just going to say it. My spouse comes home and is pacing and irritable. I'm like, go out for a walk. Just take in, ask Tammy, just getting yourself out there and breathing and getting your body moving really does release a lot of tension and stress. And by the way, that's why we act out to release tension and stress. Um, the other thing I was just going to say before I let Tammy please answer questions is um, I think you have to trust the process. You know, you're working with someone, you have help. I think the more people you let know that you're putting yourself in an accountability situation, the better. So the more you let other folks know what you're doing with your phone. And, you know, I might say for a little while, I'm not going to go online on my phone unless I chat with someone or text someone or, you know, the more you can bring people into your cho choices, the less it feels like I'm alone and I'm going to make a mistake. So uh, that's the best I got today, Tammy. Well, and I think that, you know, I mean, if, if there's so many things that can be triggers. So if I'm constantly worrying about the triggers, I'm focused on the negative rather than focusing on, you know, what do I have control over? And that's, you know, my actions and reactions. So if I've set up, you know, if I've set up a good plan, does it mean that nothing is ever going to be able to invade that? That's not true. So, but if I continue to do what I need to do to take care of myself, as soon as I start feeling that trigger, I've got a plan of what I'm going to do, who I'm going to call, who I'm going to text. You know, it's going to be a positive thing for my recovery, you know, and Dr. Rob is right. Getting outside is really healing for me. And I make sure I do that every single day because I really need that. If, you know, I mean, my poor family would, like they would toss me outside if I didn't go outside myself. So, you know, it's really important for me to connect with nature. I'm intentional. I've shared this on another webinar. I'm intentional. I'm looking for things. I'm, I made a point of looking for, it was a, a glorious sunrise this morning. I'm out running and somebody else socially distanced on the sidewalk, you know, w was commenting on, it. I said, yes, this makes getting up and running at this hour worthwhile because I get to see this amazing painted sky. So, you know, but I'm intentional about that or looking at, you know, flowers or whatever it is, you know, so the more of that I'm doing, the more I'm filling myself with good things. And the less, even if something's a little triggering, it's going to be a little triggering and I'm going to have some resiliency to be able to go, yeah, don't want to choose that. I'm going to choose something else. So that's my thoughts. I wanted to add too, um, and Tammy's right about how you take care of yourself will mean a whole lot, but there is, we say one day at a time for a reason. And it means be where you are in this moment. And you know, some people need to do an hour a time. Some people need to do every 10 minutes. It doesn't matter what it takes to get through. But I think putting expectations on yourself about tomorrow and the next day and the next day, really, we just, I was thinking today how little I really have control over. And that made me feel a lot better. Because as Tammy said, we can do this and support each other. And this, I feel like, like we can really make a difference. And that's the best we can do. Anyway, please, Tammy, what do we got? Well, but I want to, so we have very little control over like all of that. Everything. Stuff. Yeah. But, but, but I don't like, I have, I got really caught up early in COVID of like all my choices were gone. And I thought, no, there's, they're smaller. I have fewer, but I can still choose, you know, and that really helped me. So I've been intentional. I'm choosing to do this. I'm choosing to do that. You know, I've, I've chosen, you know, I'm not doing news and I'm like, I'm really careful about what's invading my space because I need to be in order to do my self care. So but I still have choices about how I act and react to situations and other people and everything else. So. Well, now I'm going to add to that because I think that recovery has never been about not doing things. It's not about blocking your, I mean, it's, it's important to have steps like blocking your phone and stopping the behavior and getting support, but really Tammy nailed it. It's about what, what are you, what are you doing to 
at least, if not enjoy, at least distract or comfort yourself out in the world when you have this big thing that you used to do that you now have to replace, you know, uh, get creative. I mean, I, there are certain, well, I won't say what kind of art and stuff I'm into, but I really got into it after I got sober and I realized that part of my brain had been really freed up. So the point is, it's not about what you don't do, it's about what you do do. And I think that's what Tammy was saying and about being intentional. You know, you need to have really healthy pleasures out there in the world it's not going to replace your acting out, but it's going to make you feel a lot more hopeful. Anyway, we should get to more questions. Yes. Well, but I'm thinking, you know, it's like we always talk about what not to do and, and no, no inner circle and avoid the middle circle. Right. But we spend less time talking about the, the healthy stuff that we, sh we can and should be doing, you know, to help ourselves. So um, what is a good game plan for triggers? I kind of feel like we mostly address that. Do you have any other thoughts? Well, again, it's just, I will say this over and over. It's about being in touch with people. You know, if I thought that, you know, I was going to have to figure it out on my own and, and, you know, like the guy with his phone, I would be in trouble. But if I knew I had a few people I could call when I was feeling triggered. The other thing I think about triggers that I try to help people really understand is you, by now you probably know that the desire to do whatever you want to do is not probably really about that. So if you can think about the desire to act out on any level as oh, something's going on inside of me that I need to pay attention to. And then maybe if you don't even know what it is, but you're going to go connect with someone else because connecting with someone else will always make us feel better. So I think the desire to act out, if you don't see it as a path to doing it, you can at least in your brain say, oh, I didn't want to do that this morning, but now I want to do that. Maybe there's something going on inside of me. And if you use it as a form of identification and stand back and see it rather than be in it, you could make a lot of good choices um, instead of doing that. And I think good self-care so that you have the bandwidth to think about it rather than just react is really helpful too. Um, I see some people are putting questions in the chat. Just know that I'm going to handle everything in the Q&A first. So um, if you would keep your questions in the Q&A, it really helps me keep track of them. Okay, so next question, how can I heal resentment? That's a great question and a, like a huge question. <laughs> Well, it's a little unclear, like who is being resented for what? And I think that matters. Um, I, I can say something about forgiveness. Um, there are some really good books out there about forgiveness. And one of the things that I really liked when I read about it is it's kind of like grief. It's many, many stages of understanding things, emotionally connecting things, you know, um, so um, I love the idea that forgiveness doesn't just happen, but there's a whole bunch of process that we have to go through inside of us and in relationship to others. And it is what it is, like grief, it works itself out. Um, but there's one more thing about that question. Um, oh, well, we do have a 12-step program. And one of the things that is uh, a big part of it is working through not only our resentments, but our part in our resentments. And I've heard people say things like, you know, that person I resented so much, well, now I pray for them every day, or now I put them in a healthy light and just really wish them well, because turning our resentments into, um, I don't know, what's the word, Tammy, turning them into um, appreciations or, you know, opportunities to learn. Um, and we don't want to wish anyone unwell. We really don't. We're maybe hurting or sad, but we can just think that they're doing the best they can and let go of it. So anyway, Tammy, you have a lot of experience with resentment. I, I, <laughs> I, no, I did. One of, the, one of the things I hated the most was somebody told me, you're allowing someone to live rent-free in your head. That made me really angry and you know i was like wait, wait they did all this stuff to me and like i'm the you know victim and, and what i finally learned was in order to be able to move past like those people they maybe didn't even have a clue that i was harboring a resentment and here i am miserable and angry and upset and all of those negative emotions and so yeah i had to learn to i had to pray for good things to happen uh, for that person and be quiet about like I wasn't telling them and by the way I'm praying I mean it was like I had to just do that and it was really challenging because you know I would have rather imagined something really horrible happening but I didn't you know and but and and in that for process no I did a lot and then I went okay I need to shift this and right. and I have employed that you know I've got a few 24 hours and I had a few challenges a few years ago and I was like the only way I'm going to get out of this is if I start praying for that person. 
And I did, and it worked and it still works. And so, you know, like you were talking about, um, you know, in these challenging times, and I actually was thinking about this and may write a blog about it, um, uh, but the same things that I learned to do in early recovery are the things that I'm continuing to do at this point, and they still work, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. the same stuff. So it isn't like you go, oh, I'm gonna move past these things. You know, I do them differently, but, but they're still the basic tools that I've learned are still serving me well so and where did you learn them the 12 steps other people okay. yeah it you know it, it was like they had to teach me how to live a different way and and they and i had a i went to treatment and i had a great therapist so so i've had the benefit of lots of support that i needed and i i want to give another plug for 12-step programs what people i think miss out they just don't think about it especially therapists who aren't big fans of them is that you know, you may come to see me for therapy for a year or two, or you might, you know, see someone great or couples, and but therapy ends and addiction doesn't. So six years from now, three years from now, you may be struggling with wanting to act out or have acted out. I don't know that going running back to therapy is really going to be your answer. How much time are you going to spend in therapy? Now, granted, I spent a few decades in therapy, but I'm a different, I'm particularly screwed up. But you know, my point is, is that it's about having those connections, those relationships. It's building that platform of support that, that no matter what else is going in your life, those people don't care about it. They just want to support you. And I, you know, I, I think there are people who barely know you who would say, "Come sleep on my couch if you really feel like you're going to act out." I mean, there is that depth of, I think, compassion to really want to help my fellow man. And uh, so I don't think people can get enough of that. And what they don't realize is they're not entering a cult, and they're not saying that they can't manage their lives they're saying that they need help managing their lives and that's the greatest gift that i think we get there is we get there asking for help yeah i've said too much tammy i'm sorry no no no. no it was great so um i'm only 90 days sober and doing all i can to be sober and start recovery are there any good pointers to try and have true empathy for what i have done to my spouse i have cried and felt very sorry but i feel like i'm still not giving all i can and try to help her um, what was the period of time? 90 days? 90 days, yes. Okay, so um, why don't you give one answer and I'll give the other because I know that one involves a book and the other involves what it means at 90 days. Pick one. Yes, well, okay. okay. Uh, all right, and I like both of them. So I'll start with the book. So okay. uh, the first component, Dr. Rob wrote a book called Out of the Dog House. And it's, a, I, I call it a primer for how to rebuild trust, how to get from where you were to a different place. And so I think that that can be very useful for a good starting place. Well, the subtitle for Out of the Dog House, by the way, is a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. And it is because if you're a man, and I, I imagine you might be, um, it's very hard to develop empathy when we've been defending and protecting and hiding and, you know, and then that person's so angry at us and so upset and we don't want to see that angry face and it interferes with our feeling bad sometimes because nothing we seems to do make them better. And so number one, I wrote Doghouse because men do not understand the degree of harm they cause a woman when they cheat on her, you know, on any level. Like we go to a strip club and it's like, oh, that was like going to the gym. That was fun. But if, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with my relationship, doesn't have anything to do with my relationship, we think. But if you, our spouses find out, they think, they say things like you ruined my life. And I thought you cared about me. And so the way we think about these things is different as men and women. And then men think, well, it's been 90 days, it's been three months, and I've been giving this person candy and flowers and, you know, really saying I'm sorry a lot, why hasn't it gotten better? And here's the other piece is that I think 90 days is very early. Think about how long, I'm guessing, you spent hurting this person without them knowing. And how much time do you expect them to have to forgive you or be kinder or maybe no matter what, in fact, I know this, no matter what you do, they're going to be angry and upset and disappointed and because that's where they're at. And it's way too early, I think, with 90 days of sobriety. Oh, I'll tell you my favorite 90 days of sobriety story, if that's okay. So you mind, Tammy, I know I tell this story. Oh, more than please. Once, but, you know, I had a client who got 90 days in his 12-step program. This is true. And he went to his, when they handed him the little chip says 90 days, he was so excited. Everyone in the meeting gave him big hugs and were so proud. He did great. And then he came to group therapy with me. 
And he said, look, everybody, I got a 90 day chip. And everyone, all the guys were like, Ooh, good job. And 90 days, that's great. And then he went home to his wife and he said, look, honey, I got a 90 day chip. And she said, big fucking deal. Excuse my language. She said, so you've been with hookers and having affairs for eight years. And I'm supposed to cheer because you have 90 days. And of course she's absolutely right. It's not her place to do anything but hurt and be sad and angry and try to figure out if trust can ever be restored. So our expectation, by the way, one more thing. I think that wanting to help your spouse feel better is not necessarily about her or him. Sometimes it's about us. I'll feel better if my spouse is so angry, even about myself. I won't feel so badly about what I did when my spouse, I mean, really examine your motives here, because if you really have empathy for your spouse, you're going to let that person be really angry and really hurt and just say to them, you absolutely deserve this. I hurt you so badly and I know I can't fix it. And that's about it. And all of this out and out. And by the way, if you buy out of the doghouse, I make 12 cents, but it might save your relationship. Um, Tammy, I, I know I said a lot about that. Do you have stuff too? No, I, I, I think all of that is really valid. It's, it's just a process. And I 100% agree that, you know, it's, you've been doing this for a long time. So you cannot expect that in a, you know, we, I get calls a lot. Like today we had a lot of calls and today I told a lot of people, the acting out is a symptom. There's underlying issues. And so, you know, you addressing those, you learning to do that, you need support and help to do that. Your partner needs support and help to, to just grieve and be angry and betrayed and all of that. And on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, we've got spaces for men who are addicts, females who are addicts, males who are partners, females who are partners. We have all of those resources, free drop-in groups. And Dr. Rob's Sex, Love, and Addiction podcast has had, it was like 570,000 downloads last I looked. So... I, I don't look every day. Um, but anyway, well, we so got there's a note resources. Today. We got a note today. That's why we found out. Yes. But we're also having 8,000 downloads a week. I mean, that's just, that's just like that many people. I mean, I'm just so grateful that we're able to offer something that people really value. You know, we don't get paid for podcasts. It's all free, but no, but we pay for say, podcasts, I, but yeah. Yes, we do. But I think, and I think that people don't want necessarily to hear about hairstyles or movies or politics. They want to sit in their car and learn and grow. And I, I think that's one of the reasons, by the way, feel free to type the name of the podcast in the chat if you I want to tell me since some I people will. don't know. And again, it's free, so we're not selling anything. Um, do you mind there if There aren't I, even ads that you can go to and, um, uh, you know, and <laughs> so I'll, I'll put the link. So it's on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, but I'll find the link. But anyway, what were you going to go to? You said. Next question. Oh, yes. Um, should the addict be in recovery for himself or his wife's family? My husband tells me he's doing this for us. And if we weren't in the picture, he'd do it in a very different place, i.e. not sober or in recovery. And that's sad to me. I mean, like, like people, do, like addicts don't get what they're missing out on. Like they think, but like we were talking about earlier, they think it's all going to be what's taken away from them. They don't understand of what is given to them and the connections and, you know, like not lying and not cheating and not lying to myself. All of those, like the, the really amazing things in my life are all because of recovery. So I always feel bad when an addict thinks they're going to miss out, you know, if they, have to stop, you know. Anyway, what are your thoughts, Dr. Rob? Well, I, I, I think, first of all, I need new glasses to have to tell you, Tammy. And I haven't gotten since COVID, so I'm kind of like, what, what can I see here? But it says, um, so first of all, about someone being in recovery for themselves or someone else. I've run treatment programs for 25 years. I've set them up all over the country, Life Healing Center, the ranch, uh, promises, I, you know, the programs are no longer up and running because we have seeking integrity, but I've set up a lot of treatment programs. And I have to tell you over the years that not many people come in because they want to be better people or because they want to grow personally. People come to treatment because their wife found out, their husband found out, their boss found out, they got arrested, you know, whatever that is. And they realize that they can't live with these kind of consequences anymore. And so they want to help. Very rarely do people come in for themselves. So, you know, the fact that this person is working on it and actually being honest with you, which I kind of like, which is I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you, a little, not the healthiest statement, but at least he's doing it. And while he's doing it, he may just find some things that he hooks onto or things that are useful for him. So that, but that I'm not trying to take away from your feeling um, of, 
disappointment and hurt that he isn't grabbing onto the brass rail. And I wanted to go back to something Tammy said, and, and you guys will always, again, I don't know what I say where, so I may repeat things sometimes. I'm also old, so I don't remember things as much. But one of the concepts I've really been thinking about and talking about a lot lately is the idea of home. Because a home is, I think, to me, it's the most important four letter word in the language. To me, home means my foundation, the place I want to die, the place I want to spend, you know, my happiest hours. I mean, if where does anybody who's sick want to go? I mean, we all want to go home. And I think this is a problem with being an addict is that, you know, most healthy people, I think they start out in a wonderful home and then they have to kind of run away from that and go out in the world and meet people and go to work. But eventually they want home back. So they create their own. But that's part of the problem with us addicts. You know, we run out of our families for a lot of reasons, but we keep running. We don't realize that the thing that we're actually looking for is home. It's just home was so scary and difficult at the beginning that why would we ever want to have that again? But the truth is everybody wants to create a home that feels safe and supportive and connected. And that is when we do the best. So I am disappointed, you know, for you that he doesn't understand exactly what Tammy said, the meaning of what home is and how and what that kind of coming together can be when someone is really open hearted. So the next question, my relationship recently ended dur um, during and I was 11 months monogamous when it ended. How can I redefine my sexual sobriety as a single recovering addict? Um, well, not to harp on books, but there is a book I wrote called Sex Addiction 101. And that's actually what I think the lecture series is about right now with the guys. Correct, the work the group that's going, yep, yep. Um, but in the book, and I, I talked about at least a chapter or two about how, about dating, because, you know, a lot of the kinds of books about sex addiction are often about how do you do with your partner, you disappointed your family, you know, all the relationship. But I think it's really important for us single, for you, not us, but you single people. It's one of the places we, we don't join anymore. For single folks to, to really carefully approach what dating is. And one of the things I think it needs to be is, is have a plan, just like your sexual behavior, you know, uh, how long do I need to know this person before I'm sexual? What do I want to reveal to them about myself? Um, how do I know if the relationship's going well? What are my signs that this is the right person, this isn't the right person, or I need to run? And part of that is, again, having, I call it having a dating posse, where you just have those people who, they know about all your bad dates and everything you did wrong, and they see your goals for a relationship. And so when you say, I'm going on a date, by the way, a date is a uh, trip to a brightly lit, ugly coffee shop that you both, you know, drove to in separate cars or online might be your first date. And then the second one is going for a walk. Okay. That's what dates are. They're not romantic candles. I mean, they're for other people, but not for us. Um, what was I saying? I think I distracted myself. Oh, dating plans. I think that, I mean, I know for me, I, when I got to that point, I did not make a decision about at least about a second date unless I called and talked about it with people who knew my history. In other words, you don't have to do this alone. We're bad daters. We often pick the wrong people. We often pick people that might be right, but they're too screwed up. I mean, we need support and help in making our romantic and dating decisions in the same way because we have an intimacy disorder. So it doesn't matter. The problems may be sex, but they're also relationships. They're also bonding. They're also staying bonded. All across those issues are what we really struggle with. So. I think getting a lot of support for dating in the same way that, that we get support for sexual behavior is, you know, accountability, structure, that's really how you date. And I just put in, um, there's drop-in groups. There's guys that will connect with you and be part of your posse. So join those groups. So next question, Dr. Rob, when do you truly know it is time to trust again? Wow. I'm, do you mind taking that first? I would love to hear that from a woman in particular. Yeah. Well, I... and I thought like, I think it's incremental. I don't think it's, um, I don't think you go, oh, I don't trust. And then I do. I think it's, I'm going to trust on this. And like, because this person has shown me that when they say they're going to show up, they show up. They, you start seeing like, is indicated in out of the doghouse, you see that when they say something, they're following through on it. So you start seeing, okay, I see this, I see that. So, but I don't think you ever have the ability, I don't think, um, but maybe, but 
my opinion is you don't have the opportunity to go back to the naive. This person always has my back. This person is always going to, because they've shown that they, you know, they can cheat and lie and things like that. So, so there's probably a little piece of that that's, that's gone, but I think you see pieces, you know, come together where you go, okay, I, there, I can see this. And so it's building trust. You're right on, Tammy. Um, I was thinking about that when we have trust in the before any of this happens, um, I don't hold on one second. I want to look at something. I don't. Um, I don't doubt my partner's word, for the most part. You know, my partner or loved one or husband or wife says I'm going to the store. I believe them. They say they're going to go for a work weekend. And I believe them. But once trust is broken. I can't believe what they say anymore because now I know that they said a lot of things that I couldn't believe and I'm not sure I can believe them now. So I believe that, you know, healing, especially in coupleships with these issues, love is not about what people say. Love is about behavior. And so I would put my bet on, by the way, not what I feel like, because sometimes you just, oh, I want to get back together and I see them so sweet in this moment. And, but that's a feeling that may not be based on, are they doing the things to, that they need to do so I don't get hurt again? Um, so it kind of works like that. I think love after betrayal, love is behavior, not words. Actions speak louder than words, right? Well, especially okay. when you lie a lot. <laughs> yes. Next question. Spouse of a porn addict. Have you ever heard of a person addict or not never having a sexual thought in their entire life without anyone about anyone and especially people he was sexually fantasizing about? Okay. I about fell out of my chair laughing. So have you ever? Well, I just want I just want to know, is this person breathing? Yes. If they're dead, yes. no, they're probably yes. not. But if they're breathing and they're human, believe me, I have a PhD in sexology. This is what I spent three and a half years getting a PhD in or four. Um, everyone has sexual thoughts. Everyone has sexual fantasies. Now, if he is extremely, had extreme abuse and is dissociative, meaning that he mm -hmm. leaves his body, he spaces out, he doesn't remember, you know, because he's kind of broken. It's certainly possible that someone might do things, um, might have things that happen or think about them, but they don't remember them or, or they, they were in a different, you know, that kind of, but they would have to really be pretty mentally ill or really, really disturbed by trauma. Um, so if they're fairly functional and they go to work and they have friends and they cheat on you, then they're lying. And by the way, everyone wants to say at least, by the way, that's a really bad liar. Like, no offense, but if I was going to lie to my spouse, I would say, you know, I have a lot of sexual thoughts about you or, you know, something that at least, but that's just bad lying. So, you know, I'm done. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do addicts ever lose the urge to act out or is it a constant battle every day to lead normal and healthy life? I'm 25 year old partner of a sex addict and I'm terrified of the prospect of living the rest of our lives in fear of my essay boyfriend cheating on me. Hmm. Well, um, first of all, I believe addiction is a, a mental illness in the same way that depression and anxiety. And the way I know this is that almost all functional mental illnesses like depression, anxiety, you know, we, um, they get worse under stress. Um, they can reappear when difficult emotional situations come up like a baby or whatever, someone dies. And this is exactly what, you know, someone returns to depression. So if we have, if addiction has something to do with a brain problem, and clearly it does, because our brains don't quite work the same way other people's do, then, you know, it's very possible and definitely something to think about that, he will have or she will have this problem always. I have 35 years in 12 step programs and 25 years in recovery. I think I was thinking about acting out last week. What that meant to me was, oh, you're having a bad day. You know, you need to call someone or maybe you need to take a break or go for a walk. But that's with a lot of experience. The point is, no, it will never be out of this person's mind. Um, as a possibility. Um, it's just when they're, but no, it's not like every day they struggle with it. It's more like uh, when something even that they're not aware of is emotionally stressful. Um, but I wanted to say one more thing about that, Tammy. Um, well, two things actually. If you're fairly new to a relationship, like you're dating and it's only a couple of years, or you've been married a couple of years, don't have kids, um, of all the couples that I treat, you are the most likely to break up. 
Um, it is more often the case that people have been together, you know, more than a few years. They have kids, they have houses, they have family, they have spirituality. They have bonds that go beyond the cheating. And even if they want to just save them for the kids, they want to save them. But a lot of times younger couples like yourself will say, hmm, I'm taking on a lot here. Do I really want to take this on for the rest of my And you're right. We are difficult people. We lie sometimes. We struggle with our problem all of our lives. As Tammy said, our problem is the tip of the iceberg. Underneath our, you know, is trauma and emotional problems and problems getting along with people. So I think that you really have to love us as we are, understanding that we are challenged in this way. And if that isn't tolerable to you, I completely, you know, it's like if someone has diabetes or cancer, you know, I would have to decide, wow, that could be a chronic condition that might kill, I might have to deal with needles every day. I mean, it's a different way of thinking about it. And it's obviously not as personally betraying, but it is a chronic emotional illness that will be with a person all of their lives and they can work on themselves and remain in remission. And that's kind of the goal. It doesn't mean it won't reoccur. Um, there is one more thing I wanted to say to you about, uh, about this. Oh, um, about 25 years, about your relationship. Yeah, um, so let me just say one thing if you decide to stay together kind of thing, because if you're new to this, this will be new to you. Um, I ran a women's group, a partner's group, a number of years ago, and you know the women were going around and sharing about betrayal and the things they were going through, and about the second person along, there was a woman, younger woman, maybe in her early 30s, and she was saying, you know, if he ever does this again, I'm leaving. That's it. I'm done. And I thought, and I said to her, and I want you to think about this. Well, why then would he ever tell you? If you're telling him that the consequences are be, going to be so severe that if he struggles in this way again, you're going to leave. Why don't, isn't the goal the honesty? So one of the things I think we have to contend with is what is most important in your relationship? Is it important that the person doesn't ever look at porn again, doesn't ever go to a strip club again, to, uh, doesn't call an ex-girlfriend. I understand that'll be hurting, hurtful and difficult, and I ne wouldn't necessarily jump in for that either. But more important to me would be, are they willing to come back and tell me the truth? Are willing to come back? Because a little further along in that same women's group I was running was a woman who, she'd been around for a while. She'd been married to a sex addict for 15 years, and, and she was saying something about him having cheated and fallen off the wagon four years ago with someone at work. You know, in other words, he had some kind of affair like 10 years into their healing. And every woman looked at her in the group and said, well, how can you live with that? Why would you be with him? You know, because that's where they were coming from. And she just smiled and said, you know, why would I want to screw up my life? Because he screwed up, screwed up his. Let him go get some help, but I'm not going to give up my house, my family, my life, my friends, and bust the whole thing open because he's got a problem. He can go fix it. And so I'm not encouraging to have that kind of detachment. I think that takes a lot of work, but I love the fact that she's looking out for herself first and how she wants to live her life and is not leading with some emotional reaction that she may live to regret. And I wanted to key in on the, is it a constant battle? And you know, I don't live in a battle. I, I, I live in recovery, um, but you know, it, it was more challenging early on and then like I was sharing earlier, you know, I, I, the, the tools that I had to learn have become who I am now. I, I know intuitively how to use those. I know what I need to do. And I know when I'm off because I'm unhappy and I'm stressed or whatever. And I just go, this isn't working for me. And yes. Mm -hmm. And so, so what do I need to do? And then I go back to the same basics that I've done, but, but I, I do not battle. I mean, I, you know, like thoughts, sure. Thoughts come across. Somebody was talking about a particular kind of alcohol that I actually really did. I was listening to a podcast and not ours. And um, somebody was talking about these different drinks. And I was like, Oh, I've never heard of that before. You know, like, and I was like, okay, that was way too much time for me to even contemplate that I just let it go, you know, so, so I have those tools. And I just don't, I don't grab onto that stuff now. And if I start grabbing onto it, that means, you know, get to a meeting, call my sponsor or whatever. So anyway, so next question what kind of work needs to be done for addicts to learn how to um, empathize and better validate their partners? Um, one thing I want to say is about the lighting, just really quickly. Yeah, it's I was just dark. Saying, it's going in and out. It's dark yeah. now, and I'm not used to being at dark this early. So when we do this five o'clock show, and so I'm still trying to figure out how to show my face without glare, and so I'm working on that. That's why it's a yeah. little crazy. I apologize about that. Um, 
so uh, I think we kind of covered this, but um, addicts don't naturally, or we're not naturally attuned to empathy. In fact, when we're practicing our addictions, we're very narcissistic. And we're not necessarily, you know, narcissistic all the time or fully narcissistic. But if you think about someone who is putting the pursuit of drugs or alcohol or sex ahead of everything and everyone, then they're basically saying the only thing that matters is what I want. And yet, you know, I say this often, I've seen heroin addicts who tick their kids' college fund to use drugs, but when they got sober and really worked on themselves, they worked three jobs to put that money back because it's not about addiction being trans, I mean, recovery being transformational. I think it's more about revealing the parts of ourselves that we've covered up for so long, the good parts. So um, I know you want to say more, Tammy. Well, I, I go back to read out of the doghouse. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, honestly, read out of the doghouse. It's a start. Actually, I'm going to say read out of the doghouse, then do the things that are to talked about in there. Because like just reading it, I, I've had that before. People right. go, well, I've read it. And I'm like, okay, have you done anything in it? No. I'm like, okay, there's a difference. So. Well, one of the things in that book that I really like is I really push men to understand what it's going to take to heal this relationship. And a lot of you guys are like, oh, I'm not sure I'm up for that. Great. You should know that at the beginning because what I'm writing about is this is what it's going to be like for a while. And this is where you're going to need to be. And sometimes people are like, I I'm not sure I'm up for that. And I feel like it's a gift to you partners to let these men know the long journey it's going to be to heal your relationships because far too many of them come up and say, I'm tired of her being angry. And when is she going to let go? And, you know, and, and that doesn't work that way. Um, uh, and yeah, then it's I a grief say, process. don't ever get into, yeah. If you're going to act like that, then don't ever get in another relationship and do this to someone else. Don't just go, well, I'm going to move on to the next, you know, fresh relationship because you're going to do the same thing. And it's going to be this repeat, repeat, repeat. And then there's going to be a whole string of broken hearted, people in your wake that's and awful. kids and families yes and... exactly yeah so and and yeah and you're still not living in integrity okay next question i'm a woman sex and love addict i've been in recovery two years yay sober from my bottom line of no sex outside a committed relationship i met a guy on match four months ago and he prefers to develop friendship before sex or entering into anything exclusive shocking I, at first this aligned with my recovery, but it is becoming more emotionally challenging, not knowing how long this friendship will develop, no sex, et cetera. I'm starting to unravel. How do I navigate this? Thank you. Does it say, Tammy, how long they've been doing this together? Yeah, well, it said I met a guy on match four months ago. So four months she's ago. in recovery two years and they met right. four months ago. Hmm. So I think intuitively these are really hard questions for us because these are our exact challenges and we can't always rely on our feelings. We also need objective sort of view of our decisions and how we're making them. But um, I wanted to reread this because I wanted to see this is a long question. Oh, and I think one of our real challenges is that we don't communicate what we're struggling with. We don't want to, we don't want to, so, telling you as my partner or someone I'm dating, you know, I, I'm, the sex thing's kind of getting to me and I really want to know, like, do we have a plan or because I do better? That's being intimate. When you are vulnerable with somebody, it's not, it is scary. You might not hear the answer you want, but that is how you get closer is by revealing. So you may think, well, I don't want to look like some horny woman who just wants to dump his bones when he's got great spiritual values. I understand that. And you may not, th and you may be thinking, well, I don't want to be, act like some female sex addict who's just jumping his bones. I get all of that too. But you can talk about it. You know, you can say how you feel about this person, what you fantasize about this person, and what the root, you know, I think that you have an absolute right to say, tell me if what you're doing works for me and I'll tell you what, I, you know, my plans work for you. This is relationship building. So if you're saying I'm in the dark about something as important as this, I bet there's a lot more things you guys could be sharing with each other and talking about. So I would say, talk about it with him. That was the same thing I was thinking about. I was like, what is the conversation been? And what is the plan? And if we're at four months, you know, is it at, you know, a certain time or are there going to be benchmarks of like when this, then that. So, so yeah, yeah, it's the scary stuff of having those conversations. So, but yeah, it's worthwhile. Okay. That's how we grow. Next question. Yes. 
I also have a CSAT and a sponsor. Um, oh, this is a continuation, I think. And they have advised me not to discuss any new memories. However, I disclosed to my wife four times with journaled memories. Ooh, I hate that. I have not had any real new memories for a while now, but she refuses to believe there isn't more, which I agree with. But she comes to me so intensely looking for new memories of acting out. I fear I don't have new memories. If I don't have new memories or any new details, she will go into further traumatization. She says over and over, why do I just do a disclosure with a CSAT when we've already given all of, all the info? Um, why not so, just keep discussing? So Tammy, the question is, it starts off with, I have a trained therapist and I have a sponsor in a 12-step program. And they have both <laughs> advised me not to do something. I don't need to read the rest of this to understand that maybe it would be best if you listen to them. These are two people who are looking out for your welfare, one paid, one unpaid, and they probably have gotten to know you a little bit and they understand your situation and they're giving you information. I would wonder, you know, I think the issue to look at is why am I questioning this? What is it that I want from this situation that I'm questioning these people that I set up to help me help me make good decisions in my relationships and yeah as far as your wife is concerned you you have created a set of circumstances that could me could not be more painful for a spouse which is this like drip 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 of information which you have to understand spouses and partners they're looking to find out where are they going to land you know they're in free fall from this information and when we tell them something okay this is what i did you know i was did and then they're like okay I get it. This is it. I can handle this. I can figure this out. And when they find out more three weeks later, they're devastated because they realize that they're in free fall again. And then they look at us like, oh, well, I thought you told me it the first time. And now you're telling me there's more. And that's the backbone of trust cracking open. So, um, yeah, Tammy, do you have more you want to say about that? I do. I, know you have I don't a lot hear of spouses yes. who call and you. I, yes. And I don't hear any. And she's seeing a pro-dependent aligned support therapist. I don't hear she's got any support. And so of course she's coming to you and going, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And of course you're going intensely, oh my gosh, I need to tell her more. And uh, you know, and the, the cat's out of the bag. I hate when I hear this stuff because it is so painful and more traumatic. And so I always say she's got a bigger hole to dig out of because you know she kept having to go down further, spiral down. So, so you know, I think uh, I agree with Dr. Roberts. Like you have people that have said no, and for her, you know, it's like I I love you. I want this to to be right. You know, I'm sorry that I've contributed in multiple ways, but I want to continue with the formal disclosure. Um, I would hopefully you're setting a time for that, but she really needs a professional support person to help guide her and help her have that security of what she really does need, not what she thinks she needs. So that's my And thoughts. the free drop-in groups. Again, there's so many yes. groups for spouses, yeah, spouses who are link. older and their kids are gone, spouses who are younger. I mean, again, this is all free. We get lazy therapists. Well, they're not, the, but I say we get lazy no. therapists to take some time to monitor these rooms and they do. They do us and yes. themselves a favor. Yes, they um, are. Oh, by the way, this person who wrote about relapses and he he's really in the doghouse like all of these continued disclosures that's really like that puts you let me say something about this maybe this is helpful when couples are in a good place and they're trusting of each other they're really equal you know they're they're in, they can one can make a decision the other can make a decision there's more trust but when this person when people are lying on a regular basis and then disclosing and lying you are no longer equal this person has been doing that they're one down they no longer have the right to say no no but it was really this or it was only that or because they gave that away in the lying and so in a way he, this person's really in the most difficult position with you and has put themselves there and by the way i think they need to be miserable for a really long time and i think that's fine um, are you talking about this next one that i because i haven't read this one yet are you talking about i was my talking husband about and I and I Hold have been in recovery for 16 months and there Let have been multiple the relapses. Let me before that. Oh, you can't I put, see I put that in answered. So. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, it's all the way and to that, bottom. That was, um, um, I have a CSAT with a sponsor. That was the one we were just. Right, well, that was that. Yes, I'm sorry, I went on to the next one. I'm so excited okay. about this. Okay, okay. Um, but someone said out of the doghouse for helping for a physical affair. No, cheating is cheating. Um, I, is cheating. I answered that by typing it oh. in, so. 
So well, let's, let's, let's now talk that I've about answered the, the, yeah, the question was, my husband and I have been in recovery for 16 months and there have been multiple relapses. His last relapse was in August and he failed two polygraphs in October. My gut tells me that his resentment and anger towards me right now is due to him still being in a relapse, even though he swears he is sober. His CSAT leans towards that he is sober and the resentment is from him pushing down his true feelings for most of his life and now is bringing his true feelings to, to the light and needing to work through the anger and recovery. Any suggestions for a betrayed spouse of discerning between normal resentment from the addict versus resentment and anger because they are still in their addiction? I think this is a good one for you to start, for sure. I think it's a tough one. I mean, to me, to me, if I'm in, in in a resentment, if it was directed, or if I was um, laying it out towards my spouse, I still own that it's my stuff. So if I'm in recovery, I'm going to go talk to my sponsor. I'm going to go apply the steps. I'm going to go do the work I need to do with my therapist. I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'm going to take responsibility for my feelings of resentment. You know, uh, Rob can't make me angry. I can be angry at him, but I'm choosing to to do that. So, so, but it it always like Rob was talking about. Or Dr. Rob was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, like it's always data for me. I can be looking at this and going, what do I need to do for me right now so that I'm not pushing that out at someone else? So to me, I mean, you know, there's sober is not, you know, abstinence sober, like not acting out. Recovery is the journey and getting the tools so that you actually see a difference. To What I'm hearing is you can't tell, you know, you can't tell. So he's still a hot mess. We have a treatment program for him. So um, I wanted to say something about that his therapist leans toward the fact that he's sober and the resentment that he has is pushing down his feelings. And now he feels his true feelings are coming to light, all of that stuff. So first of all, I, I always wonder, did your spouse tell you that or did the therapist tell you that? Because we have a uh, way sometimes, especially in the early time of our recovery, of listening to what our therapist says and saying, how can I move that around so it's going to work to my advantage with my spouse? And maybe some of you spouses are feeling very resentful at some of us therapists for what we've said when you really don't know what we've said. So I just wanted to put that one in there. The second one is, look, I'm not in any place to tell anyone what to do with their relationships. But I can say that if well, two things. Number one, I think you have to trust your gut. Every spouse has to trust their gut. And you may not be right about it's a relapse or is this or that, but you know that you don't feel trusting of this person. You know you don't feel the kind of thoughtfulness and, in, and engaged that you would expect from someone who's really working on this. And you're talking about 16 months. Like at 16 months, this person would be pretty aware of how they act, how they are in the world. And so, and so, um, I don't think it matters whether he's been sober or not, whether he's relapsed or not, whether, I don't think that matters. What matters is how is this relationship going? And what is it like the fact that this man failed two polygraphs and had a relapse a couple of months ago? And, you know, like Tammy said, we run a treatment center. It's called Seeking Integrity. When someone's been in program, I mean, when someone's been struggling and working that hard and they're still relapsing and they're looking at the possible fringes of their relationship, that is what we're here for. But, um, so I don't think my answer, final answer, you do not need to discern between normal resentment and you have every reason to be furious, resentful, hurt. There's enough on this page that I think could leave me not trusting for a year or more. So be kinder to yourself and let yourself be really upset because you've earned it, but don't do it alone. And this question would be a great one to bring into those rooms of spouses and ask the spouses because, and let me put it in a plug for the partners groups, the free ones. And, um, there is something about being a person who thinks, I know this is their problem, I know this is their fault, I know, but I wonder if there's something I could have done, or maybe I was too thin or too fat or whatever it is. And there's always a part of it that's wondering. And then we go to one of those partners groups and you know, you may think, oh, I don't wanna be around all those whining, complaining people. But the reality is you look across the room and you see someone who's telling a story just like yours. And they're nice and they're attractive and they seem like they have good values. And you realize, oh, this really isn't about me. This is about these broken people we've been involved with. And if only that, I think it's an incredibly useful experience to talk to other people with the same issues. Um, Tammy, the reason I forgot, oh, it's not dinner time yet. I am <laughs> hungry. 
it's but it's not what you said tonight i was gonna say it's later here because arizona doesn't change so it's almost seven o'clock so anyway can you explain why recovery fatigue happens and what some strategies are to overcome it. I find I am tired of going to meetings and doing step work at certain times of the month. I don't want to stop recovery, but I get tired of it at times. Well, I think that you've been working at this as long as I have or longer. What do you say? Um, so I'm going back to what we were talking about. What are healthy things that, you know, recovery isn't just about doing step work and reading only recovery work and doing it's about healthy connections what am i doing it, like you know i i can call a friend in recovery and not have a conversation about recovery we can talk about life you know and it can be just fine i you know i i do things intentionally that that help me in recovery but aren't you know aren't necessarily about getting the chip or whatever it's you know like what i was talking about earlier i go for a run i go for a walk i, I do things outside that you know that are good for me i have an app that is a you know a, a meditation thing that is good for me and it isn't you know i've got one that's recovery minded i've got one that isn't you know so i do things that are specifically recovery minded and then i do other things that are really good for me that that are healthy for me so but I think it's okay. Yeah. I mean, my big thing is always like, but I don't want to go, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. I always, I think I always know that addiction is right there. And if I, like, I don't want to get so far away from it that I forget. So that's my big thing. And that's exactly what I was going to say in a different way, Tammy. It's like, um, I remember someone saying to me, you know, when I think I'm doing fairly well in recovery, the addict, my addict is in the corner doing push-ups. And so there's always that part of us that is still very ready to go out there. And so, I mean, two things, I don't want to make this assumption, but I'll just say sometimes when I want to run away from things, it's probably when I most need them. And uh, that's one thought. The other thought I had is kind of what Tammy said, switch it up. You know, I mean, we do, I volunteer on In The Rooms, uh, intherooms.com. We do a, a recovery Saturday every, every month. In other words, you can go hear speakers. You can go to other kinds of meetings. You can, you know, uh, do some journaling. You can put the steps aside for a while and just, you know, I remember a friend of mine saying, you know, if recovery was all sackcloth and ashes, if it was just misery, why do it? And, and I think that means the work too. I couldn't just work with these folks. I had to go to lunch with them. I had to hang out with them. I had to watch movies on Zoom with them. I mean, these needed to be people I cared about. It wasn't just, and in fact, the work was not as useful if I was just plowing through it. One more thing. Um, sometimes I've, well, I've run a lot of treatment centers. I've created a lot of treatment centers. And you know, I have clients who they come in and they're dragging their feet. They don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. And then, but, and that's fine. We know how to handle that. But then there are the perfect students. They come to treatment and they've done every assignment before it was ready. They've already done next week's work, but they've read all of the lectures. And of course, there are people who need to just kind of do a little bit less. And so I want to say the same thing to you. You know, maybe you don't have to do perfect recovery. I'm not saying you want to slip, but maybe you want to watch a movie instead of going to that meeting. And by the way, I really recommend Nurse Ratchet. I'm telling you that series was wonderful. <laughs> I'll plug it. But um, anyway, Tammy, anything else about that or should we move on? I do because I, I thought of this. My therapist in, in treatment said, if you don't make recovery fun, you're not going to make it. And I made recovery fun. So I, I was very intentional about, you know, my, this was back in the olden days. We, we, my recovery group, I we went roller skating together. We went cross country skiing. I lived in Michigan. You know, we did fun things together. You know, we maybe didn't even talk about recovery or steps or anything, but we had fun. And I, but I was with like-minded people that taught me how to live differently. So. And I think retreats, you know, back when we can go back, I used to go to retreats with me my too. brothers and program and, you know, we'd spend a, yeah, we'd work on stuff, but we'd take walks, we'd hang out. We, you know, it was really, a wonderful bonding. You know, you know mm -hmm. I think there used to be a New Year's retreat every yeah. year in Santa yes. Barbara, but um, and dances anyway. and things like that. There, uh, yeah, but it was about making it fun, and you know, I still do. I still do things. So anyway, and and you'll always rather act out because that'll be a lot more fun in the moment, but not in the long term. Yeah, yeah, and it, like at some point, like that isn't that isn't anyway. Okay, so I'm a porn addict who seldom orgasms with my wife. Haven't watched porn or acted out in 18 months. When do you think things will turn around and straighten out? <laughs> uh, um, 
I mean, there are a number of ways to look at that. So first of all, as a, as a, as someone who's trained in psychotherapy and the first thing we look to is the physical. So have you been to the doctor? Have you had your testosterone checked? Have you, have you been medically checked out so that um, if you are unable to achieve orgasm, you know, is there anything medically going on? Testi testicular cancer. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be happening. And so the first thing we always rule out is, you know, is there something medical? That's what a good therapist does. And the next step is, you know, um, is there something often trauma-based inside of you, something that you're reacting to or responding to that shuts you down? Um, there's also sex therapy, which believe it or not, some of you folks, no matter, even though you've had so much sex, when it comes to be intimate with a partner, not so much. We don't know how to do that. We run away from it, you know. And so there are folks with erectile dysfunction, with, um, with you know, vaginismus, all of those things who really need um, to learn from someone how to have healthy sexuality. In fact, in fact, I'm about to do a podcast tomorrow with a couple named Bill and Ginger Burka. And they wrote a book called, you'll love this, Sexual Reintegration Therapy? Is that what it's called? Sexual Reintegration? Sexual Reintegration Therapy. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. But, and I've listened, I've read the book, I've listened to them talk, and it is about exactly what you're talking about, is just reintegrating healthy sexuality when there's been betrayal and addiction. So um, I really, you know, check out the Burkhaws. I think they do workshops, uh, Bill and Ginger Burkhaw, B-E-R-C-A-W. Um, and they do online workshops for couples who are struggling to regain sexuality. If you want to know more about that, write Tammy at Tammy at Seeking Integrity, um, or you can always reach me, Rob, at SeekingIntegrity.com. Uh, and the podcast will be on, I put the link in the chat um, on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. Next week. Probably next, next week. week. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the um, next question, and I'm not quite 100% on this one. So my wife wants a three-day full disclosure in order to move forward. She explains that there is a door in our house and I have, I only have access to. I'm willing, but who is involved? If not, what can be involved out of the norm? I don't, do you understand that question? Well, not really, but I will say okay. that I don't know what a three-day disclosure is. Um, well, there are disclosures. some therapists that do a three-day disclosure workshop. I'm not a huge fan, but oh, that's... well, that might be a different issue um, where yeah. you have a couple and help them work through it over a period of time. But a disclosure itself, even in that kind of situation, should be, you know, we read it, we we hear it, we ask questions about it, and then the rest of it is dealing with feelings, you know. So. Um, I wasn't want to say something else about that, but the idea of, I don't think I could take three days telling you all about my sex life. And I had a lot of sex. I don't think, and partners often, I have to say, you guys, it's not a criticism. You try to comfort yourself with information. If I know this, if I know that, if you just tell me this, if, and the thing is you will say to us, and this is my last question, but of course there's always another question, another question. And so that, is part of way, what makes it difficult um, when you feel like you're constantly doing some kind of disclosure. Um, so I'm not sure if I could say much more about that, Tammy. I, I, and I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 659 or 559. So. Um, oh, well, so I know that your, you are hungry because you're an your hour dinner, later. Yeah, than it's your me. dinner time. So, so, so And there's, there's another a, group starting. Yes, at, right. yeah, in five minutes, the cruise control group is. So, um, so group, right. we did not answer one question. And I'm sorry about that, but please bring it back next week. And uh, Or uh, I'm on intherooms.com every Friday at six o'clock. I do the same thing, only unfortunately without Tammy. And it is a place full of 12-step meetings. Great place to, now nah, you want to enjoy your Friday. Yeah, me. but well, uh, and I do the Super Saturday um, Recovery um, Summit, which will be November 21st on that platform. So, um, so I am on that platform, not like you, but I am a little bit. So, so he's freezing up again. So I'm going to say goodbye, everybody. See you next week. Join us on the other platforms. Bye. And I don't know if I'm freezing or you are, but we should go. Have a good night.